It's good to see you again this evening. Uh, as we said this morning, we're going to talk about the regenerated earth this evening. Is this a true doctrine that the earth will be regenerated? Or could it be a false doctrine? Why is it lifting its ugly head today? You know, like the horns on the beast of the perdition. If they use scripture to prove their point, does that make it valid? Is it a valid belief to live by that the earth will be regenerated? The source of this comes from Randy Alcorn. He has a book called Heaven. He states that the earth will not be destroyed at the end of the world. But I wonder what he thinks end of the world means if it's not going to be destroyed in the end. He avows that it will become a permanent place not only for the multiplied billions who have inhabited the earth over the centuries, but even for God the Father himself. Also, there will be the innumerable company of angels that are in heaven now, here on this earth. If Jehovah's Witness thinks that 144,000 is all that can get in heaven, what does he think is going to happen here on earth? With all of these people and angels being here. Every single being in the universe will inhabit this earth. Is what he tells us. There will be no beings anywhere else in the universe but here on this earth. The earth will not be a spiritual place. It will be just as it is right now a physical place. Now you're looking at Randy Alcorn's opinion here in a book that he wrote. A physical place, just like you have right now. Why not go ahead and call this heaven? Because it's rampant with sin, right? Therefore, he can't call it heaven yet. You know, this is unlike Jehovah's Witnesses' view of the eternal earth. Alcorn and his followers believe heaven now exists, and it will be brought down to earth. Jehovah's Witness knows that there is a heaven up there. But they say that it is full. So they're going to have to come down here to this earth to live. Nothing will exist outside of the earth in its immediate atmosphere, according to Randy. Alcorn states that his theme, he uses blistering terms here against those who do not go along with him. You know, there are a lot of people out in this world that try to put you down because you don't think the same way they think. His question is, what lies behind our notion that God is going to destroy the earth and be done with it? He states that he believes that God has a weak theology. He doesn't think that God's theology is as strong as his own personal theology. Otherwise, it would not be a weak theology. Though we'd never say it this way, according to Randy, we see him as a thwarted inventor whose creation failed. Is this sounding familiar? A thwarted inventor whose creation failed? Having realized his mistake, he'll end up trashing most of what he made. Well, we know God does not make mistakes. Never has and never will. Why he would think that God is so fallible, I don't know. His consolation, that is God's consolation for this failed earth, is that he's going to be able to rescue a few of us from the fires of hell. I wouldn't think that was much of a consolation. None at all. But this idea is simply emphatically refuted by Scripture, according to him. 
He does not believe there'll be in a heaven, and he believes that it's refuted in the scriptures. You know, God has a magnificent plan, and we will not surrender the earth to the trash heap. That's what he says on page 90 of his book. I don't know where he thinks he has the power to do this, to decide what happens to the earth. But he says, we will not surrender the earth to the trash heap. In order to be unmistakably clear about what he's teaching on this, let's hear him again. He, God the Father, will actually come to live among us on the new earth. Page 184 of his book. What about Jesus? Well, he will also physically reside on the earth with us. Page 188. The theme of Randy Alcorn's book in, on heaven strives for something that's sensational. You know, sensationalism will sell a book. So that's what he's trying to do. Let's observe. Heaven is God's dwelling place. It will one day be on the new earth, according to him. Further, that God would come down to the new earth to live with us fits perfectly with his original plan. Where in the Bible does it say that God's original plan was to come down here and live with us on this earth? Randy says that's what it is. You know, God could have taken Adam and Eve up to heaven to visit with him when they were in this world. But he didn't. Instead, he came down and walked with them in their world. Genesis 3, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. That's his, one of his proof texts. God came down here. Instead of taking them up there. You know, Jesus says that anyone who would be his disciples, he said, my father will love him and he will come and make his home with them. That is what he says in John 14, verse 23, isn't it? Jesus answered and said unto him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. See what his intentions are here? He's going to take this scripture out of context and utilize it to his advantage. He's going to come down here and he's going to make his home with us here on this earth. This is a picture of God's ultimate plan. Not to take us up to live in the realm that he made for him, but to come down here and live with us in the realm, realm that he made for us. The incarnation is about God inhabiting space and time as a human being. Is that not what Jesus did? Jesus came down, was incarnated as a man, and dwelt here on this earth with us. The new heavens and the new earth are about God making space and time his eternal home. What's wrong with the one God has now? Nothing. Far better than what we have here. Why would he do such a thing? He goes on to say, As Jesus is God incarnate, so the new earth will be heaven incarnate. That's on pages 45 and 46 of his book. He's going to bring God down here to live with us in this world. Jesus is going to come with him. Both of them will be here with us on this earth. And all of the angels and everyone who ever lived on earth. 
This book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn is being recommended, is being preached, and has been followed by the members of Church of Christ. Believe it or not, hook, line, and sinker, they're swallowing this and putting it out as the truth. A quick look at the author will give a background for this erroneous teaching and why it contains what it contains. Randy Alcorn is a denominational preacher who teaches in two schools in Oregon. Each of them have doctrinal statements about their own website and these doctrines their students and faculty are to uphold. If you have a copy of this lesson, and most of you do, the websites are posted in that particular line. Some of their statements are salvation by faith only. Baptism is not necessary for salvation. The Holy Spirit has a direct operation upon your soul. The eternal security of the believer that is once saved, always saved, is part of their doctrine. And premillennialism and some of their other articles of faith are included in that website. When a book like this is being recommended by the church for people to read, especially with the eldership recommending it to a local congregation, serious, spiritual, destructive consequences will go with that. And it's not enough to say, take the meat off the bones, because there's nothing there but bones in this book. It all needs to be thrown out. He has no truth in his book on heaven. Randy Alcorn was already hardened by materialism when he wrote this book. The espousal of premillennialism puts its advents in the same problematic position today as the Jews were in the time of Jesus' personal ministry. They rejected the spiritual kingdom of Christ. John 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. How much clearer could it be? This earth will not be his kingdom. This is physical. The kingdom is spiritual. They crucified him. And they look for a material, physical, earthly kingdom. Such as they had in the days of David and the days of Solomon. That's what the Jews were looking for. All premillennialists believe God failed in his promise to give all the land to Abraham and they are obligated to restore all of the Jews back to Palestine in order to fulfill that promise made in Genesis 13 verse 15. Did God fulfill that promise? Yes, indeed he did. They have no leg to stand on. All they can do is totally ignore Joshua 21, verse 43. It says, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they dwelled in it. Joshua 21, verse 43. The Lord will always keep his word. And he did just that, regardless of what the premillennialists say. You know, every premillennialist from C.I. Schofield to later on Hal, uh, Hal Lindsey and John Hagee and Tim LaHaye, more recently, all of them have closed their eyes to that verse. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. They don't want you to talk about it. When confronted with Bible teaching, the premillennialists reply that, while God did give Israel most of the land, 
He did not give them the entirety of the promised area. Yet the Bible text affirms that the Lord gave Israel all of the land. Further attempting to rebut the truth, premillennialists argue that there are certain aspects of what God promised Abraham that were never fulfilled. So therefore, God remains obligated to the Jews to return them to Palestine. They can't even tell you what these things were that were not fulfilled. The only thing they can say is the land promise was not fulfilled. Yet two verses later, Joshua put it in unmistakable, irrefutable terms when he declared, Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Joshua 21, verse 45. How much does all include? Everything, doesn't it? Everything he promised, every good word he told them is there. And Joshua is not only emphasizing the point that the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. He wrote a chapter in chapter 23. He underscores this particular subject. He says, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. In other words, he's dying. These are basically his dying words. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord God, your, the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Joshua 23 verse 14. Not one thing failed. How can these premillennialists say all of this stuff and not believe what the Bible tells them? They're denying the word of God. That's what they're doing. Certain aspects were promised. And Joshua says, not one thing failed. Who are you going to believe? Joshua or Alcorn? You know, denominational people agree, and then they will promote premillennialism uh, if they've been taught that all their life. And if that's what they want to do, well, that's their business. You cannot reach every soul. There are some souls that are hardened against the Word of God. But when a member of the Church of Christ accepts the materialism of premillennialism, he or she cannot do so without rejecting the preaching and teaching of the Bible. You're rejecting the Word of God when you accept premillennialist teaching. The Bible has long been cherished by those who are faithful to God's Word especially on the subject of the church being a spiritual kingdom created by Christ. Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. And I also say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, not of earth, And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The ultimate place, heaven, right? Matthew 16, verses 18 through 19. When a preacher gets in the pulpit of the church of Christ and promotes a denominational preacher's book as the first and foremost source on a subject... All of his other beliefs need to be brought into question. He needs to be examined as to why he believes what he believes and why he is rejecting the Word of God. Well, all those members who are members of the Church of Christ promoting Randy Alcon's book on heaven take issue with the author on his clearly stated, abundantly articulated belief on salvation by faith only. On his belief that baptism is not necessary for salvation and the direct operation of the Holy Spirit on your soul to save you. 
or the eternal security of the believer. Once saved, always saved. And premillennialism. Will they believe all the rest of his doctrine or just that one part that the earth is refurbished? If the reply is yes, well, of course, he does not believe all those things. How can we know he does not believe all those things if he's believing a portion of it and not all of it? How can we know? You know, we thought he believed the Bible teaching of the day of judgment and the end of the world. As he said, he did. But now he no longer believes the end of the world. If it's going to be a refurbished earth. Is it appropriate to ask him what he believes? Sure it is. We certainly do need to know what he thought and what he believes on the teaching of the last day of judgment and the end of the world. Which when he says he agrees with Randy, he is saying he disbelieves what the Bible says. It is appropriate to ask him about all other subjects too as well. And what reference sources he places first and foremost. Certainly it should not be Randy Alcorn's book. You know, we know that um, premillennialism and a vital element of it are now being accepted more and more places. Because we're hearing more and more that Christ is going to come here and reign on this earth. And that's not what he says. He says he's going to meet his saints in the air. He'll never set foot on this earth again. And it will be burned up and destroyed. And there'll be no place for that to happen. The brethren in Galatia were told by the Apostle Paul, I marvel that ye are so soon being removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But we, through though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what you have heard from us, let him be accursed. I wonder if Randy's read that. Because Randy is preaching another gospel. A renewed, renovated earth doctrine is another gospel. A perverted gospel. Yeah, he uses some scripture. But he still perverts the word of God. It is not the same gospel that we read about in the Bible. Stephen spoke to those who were resisting the ways of God in Acts chapter 7 verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Paul also wrote to those who resist the truth. 2 Timothy 3 verse 8. Now Janus and Jambers resisted Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith. Peter said we ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5 verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey God rather than men. If you know of anyone who is teaching this, please tell them to study the word of God and stop preaching it. It is not the truth. It is a false doctrine. We need to love the truth and we need to embrace it. Zechariah tells us that in chapter 8 verse 19. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, fast for the fourth month, fast for the fifth month, fast for the seventh month, and for the tenth month, shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. That's what he desires for us to do. Love, truth, and love, peace. You know, it's tragic indeed that so many don't love the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception, and that's what this is, unrighteous deception, among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. If you don't love the truth, you're going to be lost. You need to know what the truth is in all that you hear from the pulpit. The Lord's kingdom is not of this world, nor from this world. It is not an earthly, physical, tangible kingdom like the Jews were looking for. It can't be seen with human eyes. What did Jesus say to Pilate? My kingdom is not of this world, and if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. John 18, verse 36. Notice what Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. That's what the story is, just as plain as it can be. This world is earthly, it is physical. If his kingdom were of this world, a fleshly physical kingdom, then his servants would prevent him from fighting for it. Isn't that simple enough? Isn't that clear enough? One has to have a lot of help to misunderstand what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. Just that simple. Before Pentecost, the apostles had an earthly misconception of the kingdom. Why did they have an earthly, earthly misconception of the kingdom? Well, they were Jews. And that's what the Jews were looking for, an earthly kingdom. Just before Jesus ascended up into heaven, they asked him, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They still didn't understand. As he ascended up to heaven, Acts 1 verse 6. They thought the kingdom would be a military political kingdom where Jesus would conquer the Romans and he would restore Palestine to its former glory. Like in the days of Solomon and the days of David, a thousand years before that. That's what they were looking for. If the renewed earth doctrine is correct, then the Lord surely missed a great opportunity to point it out to the apostles of this world. But the Lord's kingdom is not earthly. It is spiritual. And it will never be earthly. Never again. That's the scorched earth theory. And that is your lesson for this evening. We always want to offer the opportunity for anyone who wishes to obey the gospel to do so. Or to repent of their sins. They may have the opportunity to do this and have the prayers of the congregation. We'll uh, offer that invitation right now while we stand and sing.